Thank you, Bob. It's a real pleasure to be here, uh, darling from Dubai, but I'm excited to be part of this very exciting conference. Congratulations, to Professor Agar and the whole team for putting together. Oh, sorry, I think I was on mute. Okay, let me restart here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to introduce the panel. This is a very exciting uh, conference and uh, uh, it's been growing leaps and bounds every single year. And uh, it's very rewarding to see the success of the Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Today's uh, topic is very exciting, FinTech and Transformation Financial Services. One of the most exciting investment uh, area, we as Gulf Capital, we invest in a number of sectors, but probably the most exciting sector for us is uh, fintech. And the panel's topic today is really what is fintech? What does, does it encompass? How is it surviving during COVID? Is it accelerating the growth of fintech? Uh, which companies are doing well? Which ones are, are not doing as well? Where's the innovation? What's happening in the US and how does it compare to, say, China, Asia, and Europe as well? What can we learn from the East as well? And also, most importantly, what is the role of fintech in financial inclusion and financial literacy? They're all very exciting uh, topics. And we have today a great panel, essentially. We're joined by Marie Ellen Iskandarian, who's the president and CEO of uh, World Banking. It's a global nonprofit group devoted to giving low income women uh, financial tools and access uh, to, fin uh, to finance to achieve security prosperity. We also having us join Kavita Jane. Uh, Ms. Ms. Jane is the Deputy Associate Director of the Office of Innovation Policy at the Federal Reserve Board. And before that, uh, she spent a, a number of years at FINRA, where she led fintech initi initiatives. So real experience in uh, fintech. And in fact, Ms. Kavita was uh, voted uh, one of the leading women in innovative finance in 2019. We have also Mr. Raj Koshla the founder and MD of MyMoneyMantra.com. It's India's largest omni-channel consumer and business financial marketplace. It has dispersed over $11 billion uh, uh, to customers, over 5 million customers in 60 cities in India. Clearly a huge success. And Mr. Kosla has over three decades of hands-on experience bringing financial investment awareness and offering financial products to the Indian customers, essentially. And last but not least, we have Maxad. Is the founder and CEO of Status Money. It's a personal finance company aiming to democratize access to financial planning and services. Uh, Sir Maxad has uh, 10 years experience in consumer lending and credit card industry. He used to be the head of decision management uh, at uh, City Global Digital Payments. And before that, he was at Discover Card. So clearly a lot of experience. He's also a fellow Lebanese. So welcome, uh, Majd, uh, as a fellow Lebanese. Uh, I'm proud of what you're achieving. Clearly, we have a very exciting panel here. And so without further ado, uh, let us start. Good luck. Well, thank you very much, Karim, for the fantastic introduction. Let me um, introduce myself a little bit. My name is Alberto Rossi. I'm uh, an um, associate professor of finance at the McDonald's School of Business. And I'm also the Associate Director for the Center for Financial Markets and Policy at Georgetown. So I work in the area of machine learning and fintech. So try to understand how can fintech uh, can revolutionize uh, uh, financial services and what are the best way to um, structure uh, the algorithms that go into these uh, machine learning tools that uh, effectively provide better advice to individuals. So I'm extremely happy uh, for the panel we have today. So we have Mary Ellen Iskandarian from Women's uh, World Banking. We have Kavita Jain from the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Raj Kosla from My Money Mantra, and uh, Mad Makshad from Status Money. And um, before starting the panel, I'd like the, every like uh, each panelist to maybe spend one or two minutes uh, describing what the role is and what the responsibilities are within the organization they lead and um, effectively talk a little bit about their company. Uh, we, maybe we can start with Mary Ellen. 
Thanks so much, Alberto. And it's wonderful to be sort of virtually back on the Georgetown campus. I'm a School of Foreign Service grad. Um, so at Women's World Banking, as, um, as the uh, introduction indicated, is a 41-year-old NGO that since our founding has been dedicated to providing access to finance to low-income women in developing countries. Um, I have been the president and CEO of the organization since uh, 2006. And as our, our, our mission really for many years was very focused in the microfinance space, but as technology really became the overwhelming route to providing access to finance to those who had been excluded from the formal financial system, we've now really exploded in terms of the partners that we're working with and, and increasingly with fintech. So this, this organization is, or this panel is well suited. And then I might just add, in 2012, uh, we took on another um, set of activities and we became an impact investor. And so um, Women's World Banking is the general partner for two um, impact investment gender lens funds, and I sit on the investment committee of both of, of those. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen. Uh, why don't we move to Kavita? Thank you, Alberto. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kavita Jane. I oversee the innovation policy function at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, uh, I also want to thank the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy for giving me the opportunity to be here today and to share my thoughts on fintech. Um, before I start, I just want to give the standard disclaimer that I'm speaking here today in my personal capacity and the views that I express today are of my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve. Um, so as many of you may already know, at the Federal Reserve, we really have a broad set of responsibilities. It includes several key functions, such as conducting monetary policy, promoting financial stability, fostering the safety and efficiency of our nation's payment system, regulating banks, and ensuring consumer protection. And in each of those areas, innovation can play a really important role and serve as a tremendous source of good. It can increase efficiencies, reduce costs, make our banks safer, empower customers, um, but it can also be a big source of risk. So at the Federal Reserve, we are committed to fostering responsible innovation while ensuring the safety and soundness of our nation's financial system and protection of consumers. My team specifically, the Office of Financial Innovation, it sits within the Division of Supervision and Regulation at the board. Um, and I extensively collaborate with my colleagues across uh, the board, as well as reserve banks on various uh, fintech and innovation matters. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, what about Raj? Yeah, thank you, Alberto. And thank you very much at uh, Georgetown University for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity uh, to learn from all of our wonderful co-panelists. and. Uh, I am uh, Raj Khosla. I am the founder and managing director of MyMoneyMantra.com, uh, which uh, uh, you know Kareem uh, has so uh, has, has sort of you know shared some figures with you. But uh, in the year ended March 21, MyMoneyMantra.com originated one billion dollars of credit <clears throat> and seven million happy customers in uh, in and. Uh, in October, we were in 105 cities in India. We worked with uh, over 100 banking partners. And uh, I started this company in the year of the Lord 1989 uh, with a princely uh, paid up capital of $15. So, uh, and uh, currently we, we are a digital, a physical plus digital outfit and uh, have actually combined art, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, with the traditional model to, to, to service our customer base. And that is exactly what we pride ourselves on doing is uh, to find customer need, link it with the banks and right in the center of 800 million customers who in India, 800 million is the number of people who are less than 35 years of age. Although they may not be uh, what we traditionally call middle class, but they're certainly an aspirational class. All of them require a credit card, a personal loan, a home loan, and so on. So uh, we are, uh, mymoneymantra.com is slap bank in the middle of this, uh, you know, 
perennial demand on one side and suitably capable uh, supply side on the other. So that's, uh, that's what mymoneymantra.com does. Thank you, Raj. And uh, uh, last but not least, Mad. Hi, Alberto. Hi, everyone. Uh, Alberto, thank you for having us. And same to Georgetown University. I'm glad to be with you guys today. Uh, my name is Majd Maksad. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Status Money. It's a four-year-old company uh, focused on personal finance uh, in the United States. Uh, we fuse uh, social media with personal finance to help change people's behaviors through peer benchmarking and crowdsourced financial guidance and advice. Uh, we currently serve over 300,000 people in America, um, young, old, uh, frankly, rich, poor. Um, you know, one of our key goals is to democratize the access to financial planning and advice, typically something that has only been available to those who have um, a quarter million dollars in investable assets or more. Um, happy to tell you a bit more about how that uh, works, uh, but I'm very glad to be with you today. Thank you so much, uh, Mad. So uh, before uh, we get into the, the details of some of the questions, uh, let me start with, with a broad question. So uh, different people have very different view of what fintech is. So to some people, fintech is cryptocurrencies and blockchain. To others, it is the disintermediation associated with peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. To some others, it is instead machine learning algorithms that allow robot advice and automation. So very briefly, could you give the audience an idea of what fintech signifies to you and what are the most transformative aspects of fintech? And uh, maybe we can start with Mad. Sure. Um... I mean, I'll tell you a short story. Um, I spent almost a decade at Citibank and before that at Discover, uh, the credit card company in Chicago. And I remember um, maybe about six or seven years ago, City CEO uh, standing up on a stage, a new CEO at that, and saying, we're a big data company. Uh, guess what? Big data was a big buzzword back then, right? <laughs> um, that CEO lasted maybe about a year, year and a half. There was a lot of turmoil. And the next CEO came in and said, hey, uh, guess what? We are uh, a marketing company. Um, that CEO came and went and the next one said, hey, we're a FinTech company, right? And, and none of those things were um, arguably false, right? Um, the company does have a lot of data. Uh, it certainly does a lot of marketing and um, it has a lot of infrastructure and technology. But the thing for FinTech, um, that, that really makes it fintech in my mind is the ability to use technology to create a financial service that wouldn't have been possible without that technology, right? Um, and, you know, an example is cryptocurrency. You know, before we had the processing power and the distributed ability to communicate across, uh, across the world, um, we could not have cryptocurrency. So that is legitimately a fintech invention. Um, you know, another example I think is uh, the delivery of financial guidance and advice through video or, or through other digital means, something that was not available before platforms like Zoom that we're on right now. Um, so that to me, I think holds the key to what FinTech is and a lot of the promise as technology keeps progressing at an exponential rate. Perfect. Um, Mary Ellen? No, I, I love that story, and and I, I think that um, that that says a lot about um, that mirrors a lot of my thinking. I guess what what fintech really sort of means to me is an opportunity to accelerate financial inclusion and work around some of the obstacles, particularly for women, um, that just bringing people into the traditional formal banking system, you know, are is still really problematic. Um, you know, 1.7 billion people worldwide are still without any access to finance and the vast majority of those, practically a billion um, of that number are, are women. And, and so we're really excited about um, sort of the, the ubiquitous nature of that, you know, that phone in your hand and what kind of power that can give. Now, one caveat that I always raise is that um, 
there are 300 million fewer phones owned by women than they are by men. And there's an over 20% on average um, gender gap in the ownership of internet access enabled phones uh, by women. So the, the technology gap cannot be disregarded and, and really could be um, a limit to the enormous potential that we, we see. But at least the fintechs that we're coming into, in, into contact with are you know, working on the ground, really focused on customer experience, on user experience. And it's so many of those kinds of issues that hold women back and don't make the formal financial system um, available. And it's precisely that really customer focused, design focused um, nature of FinTech that is going to let us really, not necessarily leapfrog, but just push ahead. The IMF has put some really interesting data out there about how financial inclusion through traditional mechanisms is actually stalling. Um, and, and we really run the risk of decline. And so financial include, uh, so FinTech allows us to, you know, you know, to pick up the ball and keep running forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. And why don't we go to Kavita? Yeah, I think those uh, are both uh, really just good good uh, overviews of fintech. Um, the one question that I get asked often is, the use of technology is not necessarily new in the financial services industry, particularly in the US, so why is this different now? And you know, we also hear that we're in an era that many call the fourth industrial revolution. And so what we're really seeing here is a confluence of both demand and supply drivers that's really changing uh, the provision of financial services as we know it. So on the supply side, we're seeing rapid accelerization, of digitization, mobile devices, uh, availability of massive troves of data, cheap storage, high computing power, and all these innovative technologies like AI and machine learning that are really creating new opportunities and new abilities. And then on the demand side, consumers are demanding, you know, faster, better, cheaper, newer ways to manage their financial lives. And so driven by these different um, supply and demand factors, firms are now creating um, very different transformative uh, business models and products across all aspects of financial services, right? So whether it's making deposits or lending, payments, investing, um, financial planning, insurance, um, all of these are just uh, going through a big uh, paradigm shift. Um, and I, the other thing I should note is that probably, you know, five, seven years ago, fintech was a term that many use just for startups, right? So it's a fintech firm that's offering this product or this service. But I think now fintech is just simply used as a term to denote a new disruptive way uh, to provide a financial service or even just conduct a uh, particular business. So banks are using technology not just to change how they offer products, but they're also using it to make their middle office, back office functions more efficient, more effective, right? So we hear all these buzzwords like soup tech and reg tech, and it really is all part of the same family, so to speak. So um, I think fintech just denotes a very broad term, covers products, services, how they are offered, covers um, startups, covers incumbents. In fact, banks are also now investing directly in technologies or partnering with startups. Some bank banks have innovation labs. Some are making strategic investments in startups. So it really is a very, very broad term, but ultimately denotes the disruption of of how financial products and services are offered. Thank you, Kavita. And Raj, if you have something to add? Uh, well, yeah, but I'll try and add something because, you know, <laughs> well, there's so many learned people and, you know, uh, uh, and, and a great uh, elaboration on FinTech and its transformative power. But basically, uh, to me, at a very mundane level, FinTech is really a means to an end. You know, a lot of people talk about fintech and building technology. To me, it has to it has to serve an end. It has to be a road getting to some place. And for me, that place is really through my eyes 
And in a very narrow sense, uh, you know, for my money mantra, it is, it is the customer. You know, we have to identify customers' need, identify it swiftly, and satisfy that in, a, in an appropriate manner. And also, when, when we deal with banks, which, uh, which book these assets, and that has to be a quality portfolio. We have to use FinTech towards that end, whereby uh, we are able to service customer need and also, you know, if I can use the word loosely, park this asset, so create a portfolio in the hands of the banks, that, that portfolio should be a quality one. As far as, you know, how I see it as transformative, again, in a very narrow and mundane sense, if I can say that, uh, uh, for me, FinTech's transformative power is when it hits the tier two and the tier three cities, where when credit is made available, maybe small credits, maybe a small loan, you know, to the real, if I can, again, the proverbial small guy who doesn't have to rely on the corner money lender and is we are able to bring that customer into the organized sector at an appropriate rate of interest in some, instead of something very high and, you know, and, and, and therefore actually deliver financial inclusion in the real sense, because a, re a product has been delivered. It's not only dissemination of uh, knowledge, but we actually serviced a customer and, and, and brought that, that customer into the mainstream. So for me, that is a transformative element of FinTech. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. I've always uh, um, talking about transformative events. We know that COVID-19 has been extre extremely transformative. We know many countries have been locked down for months. And while the virus has been disastrous for many economists, there is a, a silver lining in a sense that it has led to a very rapid increase in fintech adoption in many countries. So I have a couple of questions for, for the panel. Uh, which countries do you think experienced the greatest increase in fintech adoption? And do you think that this increase in fintech adoption is constitute a structural change or do you think we're gonna revert back to normal business after COVID is over? So whoever is willing to take it, Should I? Maybe, well, maybe Raj, sure. Okay. Uh, as, as far as uh, the lockdown is concerned, frankly, um, I would, I, you know, I think it's a reasonable guess to assume that, uh, or, that India actually had the most severe and the most stringent lockdown, you know, going in fact for two months, it was, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the world press also picked it up, uh, you know, the misery that lockdown caused, but, you know, uh, that is behind us. And now as uh, the, the pickup is happening, the economy is picking up, but only gradually, you know? All I can say is uh, there, are, there are decades when nothing happens. And then there are weeks when decades happen, you know? And I tell you, the past few weeks has been exactly that. Uh, you asked about how, um, how much digitization was going on. Yes, you know, we were down that path. Every year, we had more technology in our lives, in, in our banking lives, if you like, than we had the previous year. But like they say, uh, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. And once the lockdown was in place, it suddenly picked up speed, the digitization speed, you know, and, the, the, and how, especially more so on the payments side. You know, we saw that for, I, know, I don't know what it would be in, the, in, in, in Europe or in the United States, but in the Indian context, uh, in the month of October, we had 2 billion, 2 billion transactions on the payment side, which is a doubling up from what it was in April. So that's how, uh, you know, digitization came into being. And, and, and as far as lending is concerned, uh, personal finance, whether it was EKYC, which frankly could have happened uh, eight, two years ago, but well, we'll get there, we'll get there. And finally, there was no choice. They had to get there. So we have EKYC, we have so many, so much information, so much documentation now, uh, you know, moving over the, you know, online as opposed to physically. Uh, a stark example of which, uh, you know, I'd like to share is uh, when you make a home loan, obviously evaluation takes place. You know, the value is, is, is disinclined to enter someone else's house to make, uh, to make a valuation report. The, the, the owner of the house is also equally disinclined to let an unknown person into his home, you know? 
So here, here we go. Uh, you know, the banks uh, devise alternative methods of actually doing a physical valuation without entering the property of the intending borrower. And then you, and this is something which could have happened earlier, but it didn't. But well, like they say, uh, come at the R and come at the man. So you know, so this happened, and. <clears throat> Now we see tech, tech adoption has, is now much more than what it was earlier. And will it be reversed was, a, you know, was your question? Frankly, I think we will go back once the lock, once we have, a, uh, you know, once we have the, uh, the vaccine, we will go back to a more hybrid world. If we, we'll never go back to what, it be, what we were earlier, but we won't stay in the digital bubble either. We're all human beings. We like to connect. We like to compete. Uh, we like to emote. And frankly, uh, you know, on a, in, in a very basic way, we all like to make more money. So, you know, I, if there are 50 people meeting, discussing things, what's happening, discussing opportunities, the chances of making, you know, of getting ahead are much more than, you know, for instance, a virtual connect. So, yes, uh, some of uh, some of it will probably go back to the to the old world but we there will be a hybrid world going forward as far, that is generally speaking talking about ourselves at my money mantra similarly we could have made that data lake we have actually 55 million customers on our data lake is sitting on aws at the moment and we could have had much more uh, artificial intelligence much more machine learning than we currently have and we would have gotten there maybe two years later but again uh, the lockdown forced us to get here where we are, and uh, we remodeled our operations. We actually come back in October to our highest ever monthly revenue uh, life to date, believe it or not. But this wouldn't have happened without having actually used the machine learning, used the data analytics that we did. So we are actually a microcosm, which reflects you know the macro picture altogether. And we are no different from what's happening in the world. So yeah, that's what I think is going to happen. Perfect. Thank you, Raj. And um, do we have any other one wants to take it? Okay. Let me, otherwise, let me just uh, uh, move forward. Like more broadly, I, I think that, uh, and this is kind of a question more for Kavita. We know that new technologies are all often very difficult to implement if the regulatory environment is not favorable. So as someone that is uh, deep into this at the Federal Reserve, how do you think the US is faring in the adoption of new technologies compared to Europe and China, for example? And what, are, what do you think are the main barriers to tech adoption in the US? Sure. Um, I think actually the US is faring quite well in the area of tech adoption. Um, and I would say there are a number of factors that drive that. Um, First of all, we have a technology sector that's unparalleled in its dynamism and its creativity. Um, I don't think I need to name some of the largest global tech companies that are based out of the US to make my point. Uh, but to take that a step further, the US also has a very vibrant financial technology sector. I'm thinking, of course, about Silicon Valley, about New York. They both have very thriving fintech ecosystems. But there are numerous other tech hubs in the United States as well. Um, in fact, I just read a report this week that noted that U.S. has 22, I think, of the world's top uh, 100 fintech hubs. And these fintech hubs in the U.S., they're churning out innovations at a really rapid rate. They're leaders, not just with respect to specific technologies like cloud and AI, but they're also leading in how uh, technologies are transforming financial services, right? So like lending and payments and wealth management and even reg tech that I mentioned earlier. Um, and since this is a Georgetown conference, I should note another important factor uh, is the American academic system, which provides a lot of fundamental science and ideas and research uh, supporting the use of technology. Um, and moreover, I think by and large, uh, the U.S. investment community and financial firms understand um, the strategic importance of investing in technology. So I mentioned earlier, financial firms are setting up their own tech labs and innovation hubs, uh, but they're also actively investing in private tech companies. And we're seeing that play out with technologies like AI. Um, so for example, uh, 
according to one research report, uh, at the end of last year, the U.S. had the world's largest investment market uh, in privately held AI companies. I think it noted that it, the U.S. investments accounted for nearly 65 percent of global investments in AI companies. Um, and then finally, I should also note that you know U.S. regulators both at the federal as well as at the state level are devoting significant serious resources to fostering um, innovation in the markets that they regulate. I mentioned earlier, we use the term responsible innovation a lot, and that really denotes um, our desire to promote and to facilitate innovation, but at the same time ensuring that our markets stay protected, our financial system is safe and sound, and that consumers um, are protected. And so at the Fed, um, and also at other agencies like the OCC, the FDIC, the SEC, we have set up dedicated uh, innovation offices that focus entirely just on facilitating innovation. Um, and we're working hard to coordinate and collaborate with each other. Um, you know, we have a very different regulatory system here in the US um, that has proven successful over many decades. Um, and so, you know, we're working uh, with each other to collaborate on matters related to innovation and really work more on, on an interagency basis. Thank you, Kavita. And yeah, so staying always on uh, on this topic, I want to ask a question uh, to Raj. Like, given your experience with India, what do you think uh, the U.S. can learn from India and India learn from the U.S. when it comes to fintech adoption? Yeah, you know, I'm going to try and be politically correct, and then <laughs> and uh, and not say that you know, there's so much learning. Who's going to learn from whom? Uh, what what? What, what we in India could do maybe a little bit better, uh, and which frankly, for instance, you know, the, the United States uh, certainly does really well, is that there is, a, there is a whole ecosystem whereby FinTech is able to actually provide, if we talk home loans and we talk small towns and we talk uh, you know, small ticket lending, where the FinTech lenders can go to these, uh, you know, to whether a large ticket, big, Cities, great, but medium cities, small ticket, small towns, you know, nationwide, you know, fintechs can actually go and engage with the customer, uh, probably assist in finding the property and also, you know, disperse a home loan and make a home owner out of that person. They don't keep the loan on their books for more than three months, six months. They are secure in the knowledge that this entire asset can then be securitized and move to a government-backed, you know, uh, two companies, Freddie Mac and Fannie, uh, and Fannie Mae. You see, this entire ecosystem enables so many more people to access home finance, to, to therefore become homeowners. And it is easy for much, the smaller companies, the smaller fintech companies to go and approach each customer and move that portfolio and their and all of their portfolios out to these government backs Freddie you know Fr Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae type companies and I think that this has enabled uh, so many more uh, citizens of the United States to become homeowners and if we could follow the same route I think you know it would help the general population in India as well turning it around frankly you know 10,000 kilometers away you know you know uh, I don't know what uh, you know too much about what the U.S. could learn from India, except, and I'm estimating this, you know, um, is that uh, like like the United States, India too is a very diverse country. I mean, someone living in the north of the country in Punjab has as much in common with someone living down south in Canada as, for instance, someone living in Sweden has in common with some, with another person living in Greece. So these are these are very different people. Uh, different uh, value systems and different needs, different cultures. And I think uh, there is a fair bit of diversity also in the United States. I think, and I, and I repeat that, I think, I only think that, you know, the, India may have done a somewhat better job of actually finding the differences between their needs and the different marketplaces in the same country and customizing the product offering, you know, in, 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 you know to diverse groups. Uh, I think in the US, maybe, 
you know, they're trying to look for a common denominator in, in, in the interest of scale and to offer this, a similar sort of thing, you know, to the population as a whole. Maybe that is something, the customization and the localization is something the U.S. could learn maybe uh, from, from India. But, I mean, who knows? Alberto, <laughs> could I just pop in oh, for sure. a half a minute on this? Yeah. You know, one, I, I'm, and I'm really grateful Raj just um, threaded that minefield very, very adeptly. But uh, w one, one thought that does occur to me is India was one of only two countries, Peru was the other, that targeted its um, government COVID response payments to women. And yes. it had an immediate impact yes. of if a woman, you know, had a bank account in her name and didn't know it, it made her, you know, much more active. We saw m literally millions of bank accounts opened um, for women. And there is a, a raft of research that shows when a government payment is directed to a woman, family, you know, nutrition improves, more members of the family see greater benefit from it. Um, so, you know, that's something we might have thought about in the United States <laughs> about really calling out um, a targeted payment to, to women if we were looking to, uh, um, to improve the, the family welfare. So I would yes. just uh, add that. Thank yes. you so much. No, yes. Very, very good point. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ellen and Raj. So let me move a little bit forward. I want to talk about specific uh, fintech innovation. So, uh, for example, MAD, uh, we know that status money is designed to help individuals improve their consumption, savings, investment decisions by comparing their decisions to those of their peers in a completely automated fashion. Um, so how did you get the idea for this app and why is technology crucial for the functionings of, of status? And why couldn't this be done maybe 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Alberto. I mean, I'll tell you, um, it may have been possible to get it done, uh, but I think a lot of things need to align to, to, to have innovation actually happen, right? Um, but in particular here, we're really talking about financial peer benchmarking. Right. And, um, you know, when we think about peer benchmarking, um, I think a lot of people, when they think about finance, it, it's kind of a, a no go zone. Right. So why should I compare myself to somebody else? What, what's the benefit? Um, something I, I've heard quite a bit in the past few years is uh, comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, if you've ever heard that, it's it's an interesting one. Um, but like it or not, we compare ourselves and are compared to each other literally from the day we're born. So um, just six months ago, my wife and I welcomed uh, our beautiful baby girl to the world. And within an hour, we knew that she was 60th percentile weight, 90th percentile <laughs> height. I mean, that you know is a beautiful comparison, right? And it gave us a gauge. It gave us information we didn't have before. Um, and as we grow up, we know how we're doing academically. We know how we're, you know, whether or not we're, we're excelling in sports, um, professionally, you know, you name it, the number of ways we compare ourselves to each other. So why not finance, right? Why can't we see that our spending is ridiculous compared to people who are making a similar amount of money living, you know, next door to us? Um, also renters, maybe they have a similar credit score. Um, and we really couldn't come up with a good answer. It's an anomaly of the money taboo and maybe people being a little bit overprotective with, with their data, which by the way, is available, right? Uh, the banks have this data, the networks have this data. There's a lot of companies that have this data. It's, it's no longer something that people need to volunteer. So um, really it was, it was that thought coupled with um, a lot of research that was coming out from companies like Opower uh, and others that were using, you know, peer benchmarking to get people to change their behaviors, whether it be to reduce their energy expenditure and use more energy efficient appliances or reuse their towels at hotels, you name it. Um, and, you know, my co-founder and I got together and said, hey, um, we're data scientists. We know how to get this data. Um, we know how to put it together in a way that, that could be helpful. So um, hence, the concept of status money was born. 
Um, and you know, one of the things that is absolutely crucial for the functioning of this is um, kind of open data, uh, so to speak. Um, financial aggregation, another word for it. Something that I've been uh, waiting uh, to, to see kind of implemented on, on a regulatory basis in the United States. Um, it still works. I think it's, uh, it's not as seamless as it can be. Uh, I hear the CFPB is gonna pick it up um, you know, in the coming uh, few years in this, in this new administration. So I, I'm really hoping for that. But on top of this big data infrastructure, it's not just financial, you know, uh, you know, peer benchmarking. There is a slew of new technologies that are gonna be born out of this. Um, and I think some of the, the, the fears around open data that have been voiced by financial institutions and others uh, are gonna turn into um, them welcoming this technology once it is available, either by acquiring companies that do innovative stuff or by you know, using their, uh, their own you know, new kind of um, innovation hubs or whatever you want to call them to develop services that they couldn't have uh, done earlier. So, um, so yeah, very excited to see that happen. Thank you, Maud. And I think more broadly, uh, and this is a specific question for Mary Ellen, um, what do you think are the major fintech innovation that have been extremely successful in improving access to credit and financial inclusion around the world. And so do you see also a big difference from country to country when it comes to uh, the adoption of these new technologies and their success? Um, so yes, I mean, every, every country has its own, um, its own nuances, but you know, sort of to get back to what we were seeing earlier, um, I think we're really seeing FinTech writ large addressing obstacles and barriers um, and so in many, many countries, um, we are working specifically um, in a case in Nigeria, for example, um, credit bureaus just either don't exist at all or don't, um, you know, don't refer to, don't include credit history in very, very small loans or don't record, you know, how well you pay a retailer or what your utility, your, your credit um record is in terms of paying your utilities. And so those are the kinds of things that women typically can build credit histories with. And so you've got you know, many women entrepreneurs around the world not with credit histories. And so we're working with a digital lender in Nigeria um, who are all in the supply chain of a large uh, you know, global fast moving consumer goods company to help them access um, supplier credit using the aggregators that they're already buying from and that sort of credit history that they've already got. Um, and the digital lender is uh, supplying the data to the National Credit Bureau. So helping them then build that, um, that, uh, that, that record. The biggest um, obstacle to women entrepreneurs uh, accessing capital everywhere in the world, um, I, I I don't know whether here in the United States, but I, I'd hazard a guess, is women are far less likely um, to own physical um, uh, physical land or real estate, which to a far too great degree, many regulators still require as the only form of collateral um, for a loan. And so we're starting to see some, again, really interesting FinTech models around um, access, um, asset-based financing. There's one, again, again, I have Nigeria on the brain here. There's one, a company called Lydia that we like a, a lot that's been, um, that's established a, a digital platform to act almost as a, as a traditional factor of receivables for both very small, um, entrepreneurs as well as much much larger um, companies. Um, Women's World Banking has had a uh, FinTech innovation challenge specifically around women's financial inclusion um, in partnership with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And we saw a 43% increase in applicants from last year to this year. So we're very excited that more companies are, are, are recognizing that, that real opportunity. And I, and I think some of the, um, you know, some of the, the business model aspects of our two winners, and, and we get to, to name two winners because they both then go on to, to compete on the final day of the, the Monetary Authority um, 
the Singapore FinTech Festival uh, Accelerator Day. But um, the first one is a company called MyAgro that um, works with smallholder farmers in several African countries. So, you know, the farmer is the least well served of the already underserved population. And in Africa, the vast majority of smallholder farmers are, are women. And so instead of a, a credit model where they lend to the farmer to purchase um, agricultural inputs like seed or fertilizer. They use what they call a layaway. So as those of you who grew up in the United States know this old concept of the layaway, but if in fact, it's really saving in a digital wallet. And when the farmer builds enough into her digital wallet, it immediately goes to the the agricultural um, equipment and, and, and supply company. So again, super simple, but totally meeting a need. And of course, we know that as soon as you get those kind of inputs into a farm, you can increase productivity and profitability and you know all sorts of good things happen. And then just very quickly, the second winner is South Africa's first digital bank, which is called Time. And again, they've seen, they did not necessarily choose to go after the women's market, but they've seen their greatest level of activity has been in savings deposits, interestingly, and those are, um, those are primarily from women. And part of that was sort of baked into their model in that they, they do have what we find incredibly important to reaching women is a hybrid of the in-person, so, so some level of touch so that you can build the trust with the organization and as well as the convenience of the, of the technology, They're, they um, sort of partnered with a nationwide retailer, Pick and Pay, the largest supermarket in the country. And so they have their in-person ambassadors to sort of get the women started. And then they, they build a, a digital account and they can do all of their banking digitally, but that initial interaction is in a place where women are very likely to go with other women. And so it's, it's been very smart in kind of, you know, behaviorally looking at where women are most likely to form the level of trust and convenience that they would need in order to join the, the financial system. Fascinating, Miriam. And always staying on this uh, topic of, um, uh, access to credit or access to financial services for, for females. Raj, at My Money Mantra, do you have specific programs or features that are targeted specifically uh, to female consumers? And then also we can maybe have Maud ask, answer the same question at status. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Um, uh, I have to defer to, to, to Mary Ellen for j just for 10 seconds and say that, uh, you know, the ladies are at least in India, the, our, our interaction over the past three decades, you know, to the um, to, in, to female borrowers, female cons consumers, is that I think that you know, and with uh, full respect to our male brothers, uh, I think the ladies are really, really way ahead as far as financial planning is concerned. Though they may so sometimes take a back seat, but they're very good at fi financial planning. And on a lighter note, they're also great at bargaining. So uh, <laughs> in India, uh, the, the, the gender ratio in the workforce, you know, these ratios are a little bit skewed. As we talk, currently 26% of our workforce are, are ladies. And uh, as far as uh, entrepreneurship is concerned, the ratio is even more skewed. There are 8 million uh, female entrepreneurs versus 50 plus million you know, men folk who, who are entrepreneurs. Now, <clears throat> given this uh, backdrop, I must say uh, uh, that again, Mary Ellen really picked that out, you know, what, what, what happened in the lockdown and how the money went into the accounts of the ladies. Uh, the much maligned uh, government agencies have actually done a superb job as far as encouraging the ladies is concerned, you know, on the financial services. Uh, we at Buy Money Mantra go out of our way you know, to make sure that, because a lot of these schemes are quite complicated and frequently not that well advertised. So some of the ladies, especially in the tier two, tier three uh, towns and cities uh, may not be aware of, you know, what's on offer for them and what are the advantages that are available for them. So we go out of our way, you know, in our communications and our digital marketing campaigns, you know, to educate or rather educate us to pomp us a word, to share, uh, to share knowledge or to share information, which helps them 
take better decisions. Uh, an example or two of these is um, most banks have an interest break of five to 10 beeps you know, for female borrowers. And uh, more so, uh, if there is a if there's a purchase of property and and there is and the and the registration is required, if there is a lady a purchaser, the registration fee is four percent of the property value as opposed to six percent normally. So we go out of our way to, and sometimes it has a social impact as well. If we say, make your wife or make the lady a co-borrower you know, or a co-purchaser or a co-owner of the property, it will make more sense to, you know, financially to do that. It also has some very nice social, uh, you know, it gives more ownership to the ladies and makes them part of the household. And we, we've actually gone really out of our way, you know, to make sure that in all our transactions, we try to tell the borrower that how it, it would be helpful for them if they include a lady on the, uh, you know, on, on, on the transaction. We have also been working with, uh, with women-centric NGOs uh, also to impart, again, learnings and so that all the ladies have full information when they're going into, you know, for all the schemes and the benefits that are available to them. And once more, I think, you know, like I said, the much maligned government agencies have actually done a good job, you know, as far as the, you know, female consumers are concerned in India. And we at My Money Mantra make sure that their rights are fully known to, you know, to the borrowers, to the female borrowers. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I mean, that, that was, I don't know if I could top that, but I'll tell you. Uh, um, interestingly, you know, our, our service is a, is a freemium model, so it is available to, to quite literally everybody in the United States. But um, we find that uh, our members tend to be 60% female. Um, and that was an interesting discovery for us and, and very interesting insight. Um, women tend to um, have the purse strings in the household. Um, and they are, I think as, as uh, Roger or Melian said, they tend to be more the planners um, in, in the household versus the men. Uh, so we have seen that break and, and, and that's something we're very happy about. Um, but primarily, our focus is, is really on uh, making sure that we're serving lower income communities right, and, and lower income individuals who have been left behind largely by U.S. fintech um, you know, with developments around crypto and developments around investing and robo investing. Um, I think, you know, focus is generally on folks who are uh, to use the I, I think SoFi coined the term Henry's right high, high uh, earners, not rich yet. Um, and uh, you know that's not our focus. Our focus is really on the mass market and even individuals who make less than thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Um, the way that we we serve this population is uh, firstly making our subscription free for anybody who makes less than thirty-five thousand dollars a year, so they can get full access to our financial planning tools, our financial tracking tools, the benchmarking. And uh, coming in just a couple of weeks, financial coaching with certified CFPs that they can, uh, they can have a 30 minute call with a CFP once a month. Uh, nobody else out there that I know of is offering anything similar to that. So, so that's part of our mission to drive value to them. Um, but one of the other kind of interesting um, features that we've developed is a rewards program, not unlike cash rewards programs that are associated with credit cards, except this one pays people to take advantage of some of the recommendations that Status Money's app delivers. So the app might say, hey, why don't you, you know, you seem to have enough money set aside in the checking account. Why don't you open up a high yield savings account? You know, and if they do that, the app will deposit money into uh, their status money rewards uh, balance. So they could actually earn money for making smart financial decisions and, and, and managing their money. So we pay them. Um, you know, that, that's obviously something that has attracted uh, lower income individuals to our app as well. Um, the last thing I'll say here is um, uh, one of the things that we recently started doing is working directly with employers, particularly large employers who have uh, an employee base that is generally low income, uh, minimum wage or, or, or near, uh, near that. And we're offering them um, uh, you know, to, to subscribe to Status Money Premium on behalf of their employees, effectively offering financial planning and advice tools 
to a group of individuals that um, uh, you know certainly wouldn't qualify for I'm sure what the executives of these corporations get in terms of financial benefits uh, you know from uh, large advisory firms. Uh, so that's how you know we're trying to bring financial advice and planning to uh, uh, to the mass market. Thank you so much, Mud. Uh, we are again we are five minutes away and we have a lot of questions that came in through the chat. Uh, let me just select a couple and throw them. Uh, at you. So the first one comes from Stephen Oriol, and he, he's asking, I'm curious what each panelist's view would be on the number one thing to increase trans and trans, uh, transparency in the system. Is it regulatory? Is it innovation, efficiency, tied to purpose? What would be the one actionable thing that uh, would uh, increase fintech adoption? I can go uh, <laughs> first. Um, I think it's all of that, right? It's uh, it's trust and transparency and communication. Uh, but what's important is it's all of that across all stakeholders. So you know, transparency and trust with consumers, with your developers, with your employees, um, across all departments within your organization. Um, you know, making sure that. Your tech people are talking to your legal and compliance people and with regulators as well. I don't think there's one answer. I think it's all of the above, doing it often, doing it frequently. Perfect. So the second question is uh, um, related instead to uh, data privacy. So uh, we know that uh, um, recently California passed a law that limits the usage of data without individual's permission. So effectively limiting potentially access to data for uh, fintech firms. In what ways uh, do you think this will have uh, an impact on fintech if it will and how? I mean, maybe, maybe I'll jump in on this one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, um, I largely support these these regulations. I think um, a lot of data has been misused, and and to a degree, consumers are actually not aware um, about how their data is bought and sold and used um, without their explicit consent. So um, I see that going in a positive direction, where consumers are finally going to get a say in in how their data is is sold or shared or uh, or used. Um, one of the things that we've been very clear on from day one with our platform is uh, any data that is provided to us will never be sold. Um, you know, and, and I think that's just smart. It's smart business, right? Um, uh, you know, in, in my career, I worked with an individual um, many years ago that said, use regulations as a guide for product development uh, because those regulations are telling you something about where the market is going. Right. And we're not just talking here about where the regulatory market is going, but where consumers, where their heads are at. So, um, so I, again, I see it as a positive development. I think fintech will, in fact, do better uh, because these regulations are not worse. Yeah, perfect. So let me just uh, throw a, an other uh, final question before we have to uh, close um, this, um, this panel. So we know that um, several studies have shown that access to credit has uh, been limited to women and underrepresented minorities. And we also know that uh, FinTech and associated machine learning has, uh, th there can be two kind of uh, outcomes. We could uh, potentially go into a direction where all these biases could be completely reduced or uh, maybe this machine learning algorithm may kind of perpetuate these biases. Um, what do you think uh, will be the outcome finally? And uh, what do you think is uh, uh, the best way to kind of uh, train these machine learning tools? Well, so, algorithms are designed by people. Okay. And I think that's, you know, we can never, ever, ever forget that. And so to the extent that the people designing them recognize their unconscious bias. I mean, it really is quite literally, you know, whatever, whatever bias you put into the machine, it just continues to, to, to relearn. I mean, you've seen, you know, on the, on the one hand, um, peer learning platforms have been very good for women entrepreneurs because they are sort of an alternative 
um, source. Of, they typically use alternative credit scoring, but we've also seen in in China, which has had you know the most active market, we've we've seen women tend to get smaller loans. They tend to pay higher interest rates. So, you know, even even with the technology, there there's just a a lot of bias that needs to be um, needs to be made conscious and corrected for. Okay, well, this kind of brings our panel to a conclusion. I would like to take a moment to thank Mary Ellen, Maad, Kavita, and Raj for their great insights. And um, I wish everybody a good continuation of the conference with the um, digital asset panel. <laughs>